Didoid piercings, pros, cons, advantages, disadvantages. We're going to talk about five of each of those along with uh, what you should know beforehand, getting the piercing, uh, living with the piercing, jewelry, and if you decide, hey, I don't want this anymore, and decide to take it out. Coming up next on Pros and Cons by a Piercer, Season 2, Episode number 28. So you might want to stick around. For those that are new to the channel, first off, welcome here, and I hope you're enjoying the videos and finding them edifying. And just so you know, my name is Davo. I'm a professional body piercer and have been since 1994. I own and operate the Axiom Body Piercing Studio, located right here in Des Moines, Iowa, inside Skin Kitchen Tattoo. So, when I talk to you about these things, I'm talking to a level of expertise that comes from me in the body piercing industry for well over 27 years. What we're going to talk about today is the dytoid piercing, which is a male genital piercing. So kind of a disclaimer, if you have no interest in learning about genital piercings, uh, listening to me talk about genital piercings and etc., this is not the video for you. If you are easily offended when people do talk about those things, please find something else. Also, if you're not of an appropriate age, also find something else. If you think you're going to get some kind of... Uh, sexual gratification from this video, you're probably going to be sadly dis disappointed. Uh, this in no way, shape, or form is in that direction. It is primarily for education. For those that are thinking about getting it done, those that um, their partners might be getting it done or they're thinking about it, or those are just plain curious. If you are not one of those people, there's plenty of videos on this channel that we talk about body piercing and tattooing that you're going to find a lot more interesting. Now, what are we going to be talking about today is the didoid piercing, or didoids. This piercing is done through the glands on both sides, um, almost vertically or straight up uh, at the same angle as the uh, area. Kind of you figure out that ridge right there. It's done at a 90-degree angle. Done with curved barbells. Uh, you, they can be placed on very different parts of the, the male body, I guess, um, on those glands or on that ridge. Usually, on it's a pair on both sides. It's kind of the traditional thing. However, they can be placed pretty much uh, anywhere on the top. They're often called uh, a, a king's crown or whatever, and they can be done in groupings. So there's a lot of little uh, different options with that. This piercing, like a lot of male genital piercings uh, that were developed in the 1970s, are pretty much a modern invention. I uh, basically this one did have a uh, backstory, so to speak, created by Dave Molly, uh, also known as Richard uh, Simpson, which was his real name, who was a big part of the early years of Gauntlet and one of the founding fathers of body piercing as we know it today. He wrote a pamphlet called uh, what is it called? Uh, called Adventures of, of a Piercing Freak in 1975. And this piercing is one of the ones that he mentioned in there, claiming that it was done by um, a Jewish organization called the, and I'll probably mispronounce this, uh, the Sip Per In Society. Uh, he claimed that piercing was developed to increase sensitivity loss from circumcisions or as a way of protest against circumcising children. I, it really doesn't do that, but it it can be enjoyable. This piercing was pretty much uh, developed in the 1970s at Gauntlet by Jim Ward and others. With that out of the way, let's move on to the pros, the advantages, the things that say make you say, hey, this is the one for me, the thing I want, and uh, something I desire. Starting with number one. This piercing does increase or is known to increase sexual pleasure or enhance it, usually for the partner more than actually the wearer, though I've had some clients say that it does feel good when the jewelry kind of moves back and forth in that area. I Like any genital piercing or anything that's done piercing-wise for a improvement, it really comes down to a couple different things. First off, yes, it might be more stimulating, 
but it also might be that it's a new experience and something you haven't experienced before. Over time, that new experience may wear off and not be as exciting as it once was. Next thing is number two. This piercing has a long history of healing. Um, though it does have some problems with migration and rejection, which we'll get to a little bit later, this piercing will more than likely heal if taken care of properly. Number three, kind of already touched on this, but there is a lot of different placements that can be done for this piercing. Either uh, the traditional one, which is more off to the side, to the dead center on the top, to everywhere in between. So lots of different ideas you can go for with that. Number four, this piercing can be done in groupings. Usually, like I said, it's done traditionally with one on each side. Um, they can be done in multiple ones all the way around the top area of the glands. Number five, easy to conceal. This is a piercing that if you don't want anybody to know that you have it, they don't need to know you have it. Uh, really, the only people that are going to definitely find out that you do are those you're intimate with and those you tell. So if you live in a part of the world where it's very conservative or you work at a job or industry where piercings are kind of frowned upon, this is definitely a piercing you can have and it won't affect your income or anything else. Before we move on to the cons, if you like this, find it edifying, find it interesting, what have you, give us a thumbs up. Let you know, let it, it lets us know that you liked it and we'd like it when you like it. If you haven't subscribed, why the hell not? Please subscribe, hit that notification bell so that you're notified every single time we post something. Now it's time to move on to the cons, the disadvantages, the things that make you go, eh, maybe not. Maybe not. Starting with number one, migration and rejection. This piercing, if placed incorrectly or you don't have the correct anatomy for it, can reject where your body pretty much completely pushes it out of the body or it can migrate. It's been where it moves slightly. It's been my experience that this usually happens on one side and the other side heals perfectly fine. That said, I've had a lot of clients that have healed out both sides, no problems at all, um, including uh, other placements on the top and et cetera. It's just a risk, and this piercing is more prone to. Number two, because this piercing is going to be an open wound, and then you even after it heals uh, initially, it will be very thin tissue, there is a risk of contracting uh, viruses, et cetera, so you need to practice safe sex for a minimum of six months after the piercing has been healed, which means latex barrier. No way around it. Number three, loose ends. Because this is a barbell, basically in essence the most popular, most common use, there's always a possibility of those ends coming and screwing and falling off. So they do need to be checked on a regular basis even after the piercing has been healed. Number four, your partner may simply just not like the way it feels. Uh, they may ask you to remove them or abandon them because they don't like it. Otherwise, fun time may end. Uh, there's also commonly the larger ends, larger balls, tend to be a little bit more uncomfortable. So adjusting the jewelry size and et cetera may fix the problem, but it's always a possibility because there's just some people it's like, nope, you're not going to, nope, not with that. No, no, no. Number five, the bleeding. Uh, this piercing can bleed anywhere from three to five days after it's done. It is a genital piercing. There's a lot of blood in the area, so that's very common. Now, before we move on to things you should look for, if you haven't already, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. Uh, we have a number of different t-shirt designs, different colors, and different products for you to choose from. And all that money goes to help, help support the channel. So take a look when you get a chance. As I said before, link below, there's also one of those merch bars. Things to look for. These are things you might want to consider before getting it done. The first thing being is that your piercer is well experienced with this particular piercing. This is not a very common piercing, so you really need to search out somebody that's done a number of them. They should be professional. They should be informative. They should make you feel comfortable. They should give you a consultation that it covers um, risks, aftercare, etc. Everything that may be uh, either a reason to get it or a reason not to get it. That's what a consultation should be. They should also evaluate your anatomy. You have to have the right anatomy for this particular piercing. Um, I know there are people out there that have had it done who were uncircumcised. 
However, I I really have never came across a situation where I pierced somebody who wasn't circumcised. The, this piercing. Other piercings, yes. This piercing, no. Just basically because of the location and the amount of pressure that the foreskin is probably going to put on the piercing. So it's really something that you, your anatomy needs to be checked out. The jewelry should be at least a, a 14 gauge or thicker that they suggest. Um, a curved barbell is, prefer- is probably the, the, the preferred style, in my opinion, the best option. Uh, rings, they tend to just have too much contact with stuff, and it's just going to increase your likelihood of rejection or migration. Uh, there are some kind of surface or half-surface bars that kind of help, but I don't think they're usually the best option in all cases. It really depends on your anatomy and what's going to work for you. Now, there are bleeding possibilities, as I mentioned earlier, anywhere from three to five days. It's a good idea to prepare beforehand and buy pads or something to cut down the likelihood of standing clothing. The other advantage of uh, sanitary napkins and pads is it cuts down the amount of moisture in the area, which is going to cut down the amount of bacteria in the area when you're most acceptable to infection. It also will add a little bit of cushioning while it's going through that initial tender phase. Next up, it's going to be uncomfortable to have sex for the for the first week or uh, sometimes few weeks, varies from person to person. So if you are a very sexual person and crave it on a regular basis, it's probably a good idea to get a little bit of that fun time out of the way before you get the piercing done. Uh, Also keep in mind that usually most people experience a spike in their libido after they get a genital piercing. It kind of tends to remind you that you have genitals and that you're a sexual being. So it's a good idea to kind of scratch that itch as much as you can before getting the piercing done. Lastly, does your piercer provide aftercare instructions in products? Uh, Aftercare instructions should be in writing and verbally also, uh, or there should be a video of some sort that you can go to. Uh, The written instructions should be very detailed. It should include what the jewelry size is, what it was made out of, um, and what uh, what style it is, also a date when it was done, and who did it, and what the average healing time is. I, additionally to that, you may want to ask your piercer in advance if they either provide or sell aftercare product. It's a good idea to have all your everything in your basket before you get the piercing done so that you don't have to go out shopping immediately afterwards. Primarily with this one, what you definitely need and what you should have is sterile saline, uh, nail med, Piercing aftercare is my favorite. Also, it's not a bad idea to buy those pads in advance so you don't have to deal with it. Now let's talk about the piercing itself. First thing and foremost is usually a consultation. During that consultation, they will talk to you about things like any health issues you may have. Uh, they're going to, of course, go through the aftercare uh, basics, what what cross-contamination prevention is going to involve, what you're going to need to do. Um, they also might ask you some questions regarding any pre-existing medical conditions you may have. Um, any type of medications you may be on, any controlled or uncontrolled substances, and anything that you may be allergic to. Now, when you get to the waiver part of it, they're going to definitely have a waiver that's going to talk about all of those things. They're going to list the materials they may be using during the healing or during the piercing and afterwards. And uh, you need to look through those, and especially if you have any sensitivity or allergies that involve any type of medical procedures or equipment or products that may be used. Next up, they'll pick out the jewelry. Usually with this one, like I said, 14 gauge is usually the thinnest. It's probably the most common. Uh, curved barbell, anywhere from 5 sixteenths of an inch, usually up to about 3 eighths of an inch. It really depends on your anatomy and how they're going to place the piercing. It varies from person to person. As I mentioned earlier, next up you'll re, you'll probably fill out a waiver either on a tablet or online or you know a good old fashioned piece of paper. Be honest. Uh, if you have any health issues that may impair or cause problems, uh, you can talk to your piercer about it. But it's always best, when in doubt, to talk to your doctor about it. The same thing when it comes to medications, especially blood thinners. Um, you really need to talk to your doctor. We're not experts on any of this. We're not trained medical professionals it is not our expertise and we do not know your health history enough to truly advise you on whether or not it's a good idea or steps that may need to be taken to avoid problems once that's done we'll go ahead and set up uh 
the equipment needed for this one. Also, we'll disinfect the area. Once the area is disinfected, we will mark it, making sure that the marks are even. Uh, if you're doing two at the same time, generally it's a good idea to make sure they let you take a look at it and judge whether or not those two will match. Usually with this one, I'll do line markings of the depth and, and the angle just to kind of give you an idea of how or where I'm going with that. Piercing is usually done freehand. There are some people that do this with forceps, but usually freehand is your best option because it allows you to a little bit more uh, control over the depth of the piercing. I don't know how else to explain it. Um, either with a needle receiving tube or a cork. Usually I'll go from the bottom of the glands upward opposed to going inward. Um, it just seems to work better for me that way. Every piercer is different. Uh, usually you'll feel a slight pinch. Um, just like with old genital piercings, it's like an, oh, God, that hurts, and then it quickly fades. Uh, you don't normally have all that aching immediately afterwards. However, uh, you'll, you'll feel that sharp point, uh, pinch. Usually I'll have people do a breathing exercise where I tell them to take a deep breath in and then exhale, and then we do the piercing when it feels right. After the, jewel the needle is through, uh, the jewelry is inserted, usually using a guide pin. The guide pin is removed. The ball is screwed on there. And lo and behold, you have a diadoid piercing. You might experience a little bit of slight bleeding initially, maybe a little bit of discomfort, especially tenderness of the touch, and that will fade fairly rapidly. Um, other than that, it's kind of an, oh, God, that hurts, and then it's over. So let's talk a little bit about healing. Healing, average healing time on this, like most general piercings, usually heal out between 8 in 12 weeks, during which time you're going to need to clean it twice a day using a sterile saline. Like I said earlier, I like Nelmed's aftercare, um, the mist style. Uh, basically, you just mist the area, let it stay in contact, and then dab off any excess after about five minutes. Twice daily, that's all you need to do. Except, so cross-contamination prevention. You're going to have to do some things like wash your hands before you handle it. No oral contact or exchanging of bodily fluids on or around the piercing until it heals. That doesn't mean you can't have sex for six months. That just means you need to practice safe sex, which means latex barrier. I generally suggest large reservoir condoms. Avoid anything that has any spermicide. Um, if you're using a type of lubricant, avoid things that have moisturizers or uh, scents or flavors or warming, uh, that type of stuff. All that stuff's going to feel terrible. So just plain water-based lubricant. Also, no swimming. Do not submerge piercing in bodies of water you cannot control the quality of until the piercing is completely healed. Keep pets away from it. Don't let them sleep in the bed with you. Also, uh, make sure that anything that comes in contact with your piercing is cleaned on a regular basis. Clothing, bedding, towels, all that stuff needs to be cleaned regularly and changed regularly. Fight that impulse to play with it. Um, it's anything new. We like to touch it. We like to play with it. Uh, constant contact movement, et cetera, will cause issues. Sex when comfortable, gentle at first. Um, if it hurts to do something, try doing something else or at least taking a break until it doesn't hurt. Do not sleep on the piercing. Make sure you're sleeping on your side or your back. Um, it's not uncommon in that first three to five days to notice a little bit of discomfort or not discomfort, discolorization, redness. Um, heat. It's also going to be tender to the touch and, of course, the bleeding. Now let's move on to jewelry. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the best jewelry for this, in my opinion, is like a 14-gauge uh, curved barbell. The jewelry needs to stay in at all times, um, only being taken out to replace. Do not leave the jewelry out for extended periods of time unless you are planning on abandoning the piercing. If you get into a situation where you have to remove it for one reason or another, look into glass retainers. Uh, they're generally your best option for surgery, medical procedures, etc. Now, uh, once the piercing heals, because we generally kind of oversize the jewelry a little bit to allow for inflammation and swelling and all that, you may need to downsize, and I would suggest downsizing as soon as possible. Uh, downsizing is going to reduce the amount of pressure and contact those that piercing is going to have. So always go back and see your piercer and have them measure it, check it, et cetera, and downsize. Um, with this one, if there's a huge difference between it's really loose when you're not erect or when you're flaccid, and then it's really tight when you're erect, it should be a good fit for you. Um, when in doubt, measure when you're erect. This one should be a given. Avoid 
jewelry has sharp edges, points, things dangling off of it, um, or is extremely heavy. Uh, just simple jewelry is usually your best option. As I mentioned earlier, changing down to maybe smaller balls will be more comfortable for your partner if they are noticing any discomfort. Best jewelry option, of course, is curved barbells. Um, this jewelry or this piercing is through a mucous membrane, so anything that's made of silver or sterling should be avoided. The reason being is that silver and sterling, which is basically the same, well, they're slightly different, but they're silver, it tends to leak out what is called silver salt as it, as it erodes. Your body then absorbs it, and it'll permanently mark or discolor the area. It's not life-threatening, but it kind of doesn't look good. It's kind of a bluish black, like a really terrible tattoo. So, no silver, no sterling. Let's talk about living with the piercing. Uh, pretty much leave that jewelry in at all times. As far as maintenance, you may want to clean the jewelry occasionally with warm water and soap. Anything beyond that is pretty much unnecessary. I uh, do keep an eye on these piercings because of the risk of rejection or migration. If you start to notice that, you need to see your piercer. If it continues, you may have to remove the jewelry um, and possibly look at doing it again. But really, at this, when these reject, they pretty much do very quickly, and there's usually signs of it beforehand. Uh, usually, it'll look like the skin is almost splitting open. And especially if you get to a point where you can actually see the jewelry through the skin, you probably need to remove it immediately. Now, another thing is, and I should have covered this earlier, is you are more acceptable to STDs or, or during, during intercourse, uh, sexual contact. Whenever switching partners, you should practice safe sex the way you're supposed to, which means latex barrier until you've both been properly tested and screened. Uh, you are more acceptable STDs because you have a sharp object or a metal object, not necessarily sharp, metal object through soft tissue. There's a possibility of always causing tears during sexual intercourse, and you have an exchange of a virus, and the next thing you know, you have an STD. And now lastly, abandoning the piercing. Let's say you've just had enough of it and you're done. If you take the jewelry out during the healing process, it'll probably close like any other wound in your body. Do monitor it. Do keep an eye on it. Do practice cross-contamination prevention, um, just like you would if, if you had a cut in that, that area and in any way, shape, or form. So just keep an eye on it. If the piercing is healed, it will slowly begin to close, usually reconnecting in the center and then slowly filling in from there, meaning that it's probably going to look like it's open for a long time. Uh, there will be two indentation scars, one way or another, when uh, the jewelry is removed. Not so much during, if you take it out during the healing, but generally if it's healed completely, that scarring is going to stay with you for a while. Lastly, uh, occasionally with piercings, whether or not the jewelry is in or not, they will collect what is called uh, sebum uh, or sebums. Uh, basically, it's a waxy oil that collects inside piercings and on jewelry has a very distinct odor to it. It is not a sign of infection. Um, if you squeeze the piercing that once it's been abandoned and this stuff comes out, it's not something you need to worry about. Just clean the area. It'll be fine. Well, that's it. That's all I have to say. Um, if you think I missed something or you'd like to ask a question or have something to add, please leave a comment. Uh, usually answer them when I have time. Till next time, here's hoping all your piercing skill will ease and without a single issue. And if you're in the Des Moines, Iowa area, I hope to see you for your body piercing needs in the future. Have a good day, everybody. Take care. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you in the next video. Maybe this one.